Hey everyone, it's The Diplomat, and we are on part 43 of the Chris Watts Discovery Read-Through, starting here on page 1066. And in this part, we're going to go through um, a wide variety of things, uh, including a lot of uh, FPD supplemental reports. Uh, we will also go through um, some of Detective Balmover's reports regarding the tank rescue of the uh, bodies of Celeste and Bella, uh, as well as um, some search warrant information. So on the first page, this is Supplemental 50 from Balmover. We have a CBI property evidence form. So this is regarding the mistress, and this just lists her Apple iPhone 6. And then on the next page, we just have um, the locker it was listed as being stored in and some signatures. So we'll just keep going uh, down to the next page. So the next page is Supplemental 51 from Officer James. And this is uh, from the FPD on September 5th, 2018 at 6.53 p.m. This is regarding Sam, who is Shanann's friend as well as Jeremy, who was Chris's friend. On September 5th, at approximately 6.45 p.m., I spoke with Sam via phone. Sam, who I spoke to on August 13th, was a friend of Shanann's. Sam provided me with her address in Maryland. Sam expressed concern about her information becoming public and advised when the affidavit was released, she, her kids, and husband were contacted by the media. On September 5th, at approximately 9.28 a.m., Officer Coonrod was dispatched to a follow-up at Frederick PD referenced Jeremy, returning my call. Information in the CAD notes indicated his date of birth with an address in Erie, Colorado. I printed the CAD call information and request it be added to the case file. No further information. On the next page, we just have uh, James notes. It just lists Sam's uh, name and address. The page after that, we just have the CAD call listed. Um, it has the same comments there, and it's just uh, evidence of that call. Next, we have a supplemental report from the FPD uh, on August, sorry, on September 6th at 1.50. And this is regarding a Christopher, but not uh, Chris Watts. The contact information for Christopher, a former acquaintance of both Shanann and Chris Watts, whom I spoke with over the phone, was not included in a supplemental report I completed back on August 18th. His contact information is included in this report. Nothing further at this time. So it's just a sort of a follow-up sheet there. Next is Supplemental 53 from Albert, and this is on September uh, 6th at uh, 5.45 p.m. This is also FPD. This is regarding uh, Sandra Rusek. I completed a supplemental report after speaking with Sandra Rusek, the mother of Shanann Watts, back via phone on August 16th. However, I did not include her contact information in that report. Sandra's information has been added to this supplemental, so just another one of those. Uh, the next one is FPD Catherine Lines is the officer, September 9th. After reviewing my report, I noticed that in supplemental report number 13, I stated that I reported for duty on Wednesday, August 16th. The correct date was Wednesday, August 15th. Okay, this is uh, supplemental 55, Balmover, FPD, September 9th at 4 17 p.m the following information was documented at the time it was gathered the date of this report is not indicative of when the investigation occurred on august 14 2018 at approximately 5 45 a.m i read an email from sergeant bakes advising shanann and the girls were still missing and there were no leads to their whereabouts Shortly before 7 a.m., I arrived at my office and began drafting a missing persons bolo for a press release. At approximately 8 a.m., Commander Egan arrived and I advised him of the circumstances surrounding the case and expressed the need for additional resources and to make their disappearances publicly known in an effort to generate leads. 
Shortly thereafter, Commander Egan established an incident command center located at the FPD and Sergeant Bensall released the missing persons bolo information I provided him. Later that morning, I received a call from Jillian Ganley, CBI, who stated she saw our press release and asked if I considered initiating a missing persons alert through CBI. I thanked her for calling and informed her I had not yet been able to initiate a request for assistance and asked if she could in addition to generating an alert. Ganley agreed to relay my assistance request and I provided her the specifics of the case. Later, Ganley called to inform me agents were en route to uh, assist in the investigation. Once CBI and FBI agents had arrived at the FPD, I briefed them and advised what we had accomplished to that point, which was initial interviews of Sh uh, Watts and Shanann's noted friends and colleagues, multiple searches of the Watts residence and surrounding area, searching Shanann's cell phone, initiating a press release, and a canine search. As CBI agents began working on background checks and identifying leads, FBI agent Coder and I discussed conducting a formal interview with Watts. Because I believed Watts would provide me the same information he did the previous day, August 13th, I asked Agent Coder to in interview him. At approximately 6.46 p.m., uh, I contacted Watts via phone and asked him if he would be open to another interview at the police department. He said he would and arrived later that evening at approximately 8 p.m. Upon Watts' arrival, I introduced him to Agent Coder and informed him I had requested assistance from outside agencies to assist us in locating Shanann and the girls. Watts acknowledged this and agreed to speak with Agent Coder. Refer to Agent Coder's report for specifics regarding this interview. At approximately 11 p.m., I briefly met with Watts. I thanked him for cooperating with the interview and informed him of a possible sighting of Shanann and the girls had been reported earlier. I showed Watts Walmart surveillance system photos Officer James obtained from the Walmart located uh, on East Ken Pratt Boulevard in Longmont. The photos are of an adult female and two female juveniles within the store. I asked Watts if he thought it may be Shanann and the girls. Watts confirmed it was not them and departed the police department shortly thereafter. It should be noted that Watts agreed to return the following day, August 15th. On August 15th at approximately 6 a.m., I responded directly to 2825 Saratoga to conduct a consensual search of the residence. It should be noted the search was scheduled the previous evening and Watts provided consent at that time. I met with Officer Perez who was assigned to maintain security of the residence as Watts stayed the night at a friend's house. Shortly thereafter, I was met by Officer Walsh, CBI agent Matt Saylor, and crime scene analyst Dave Yoakum. I was present for only the initial part of the search as I was called back to the police department to address a separate issue. Prior to leaving the residence, I was able to observe the discovery of bedsheets that were located in a kitchen trash can. As the bed sheets were removed from the trash, I noted the bottom fitted sheet was missing and at least one pillowcase had some type of dark residue upon it. This residue contained what appeared to be glitter. At approximately 11 a.m., Watts arrived at the FPD for an additional interview and to undergo a polygraph exam administered by CBI agent Lee. After the polygraph concluded, agents Lee, CBI, and Coder, FBI, met with Watts again at approximately 4 p.m. to advise him the results of the polygraph test indicated he was deceptive and asked that he speak the truth about what happened to Shanann and the girls. Watts continued to deny knowing anything about their disappearance but admitted to having an affair with the mistress. At one point, Agent Lee asked Watts if Shanann did something to the girls that caused him to do something to her. Watts continued to deny any involvement, but eventually uh, asked to speak with his father, who was present at the police department. When Watts' father, Ronnie, entered the interview room, Watts told him he failed the polygraph test and that he admitted to having an affair. Watts ultimately explained the events that occurred on the morning of August 13th to Ronnie and described how Shanann killed their daughters, which drove him into a rage, causing him to kill her. 
Prior to Watts disclosing the events surrounding their deaths and the location of their bodies, Firestone police investigators located, via a drone equipped with a camera, the missing fitted bedsheet and two black plastic bags in a field adjacent to the Survey 319 oil tank site. They also discovered an area of freshly moved dirt near the clear driveway area of the site. Based on the information obtained from the interview, I began drafting search warrants and affidavits for the Watts residence and the oil tank named Survey 319. Once completed the documents, I provided a copy of the residence search warrant to Officer Walsh, who was assigned to conduct the search of the residence. Overnight scene security for Survey 319 had not yet been established. As a result, I self-assigned the task, collected some personal items, and responded to, to oil site with a copy of the search warrant. While en route, I received a call from Chief Deputy Coroner Jolene Joey Weiner advising me Shanann's body had been located. Upon arrival, I met with Joey and ultimately assisted her in extracting Shanann's remains from the clandestine grave Watts identified during his interview with Agents Lee and Coder. During the extraction, Joey and I bagged Shanann's hands and also placed a clean sheet at the bottom of the cadaver bag in an attempt to preserve any evidence that may have been present but not visible at the time. Due to decomposition, it was difficult to recognize the body from photographs, but it was presumed based on Watts' admission. Joey took custody of Shanann's body shortly after midnight, August 16th. On scene, I met with CPI crime scene analyst Dave Yoakum and took custody of the evidence he collected from the scene on August 15th prior to my arrival. I signed the chain of custody forms and photographed them. Yoakum later provided PDF copies of the documents. I remained on site as scene security. Nothing further. Next is Supplemental 56 from James, uh, FPD, September 9th at uh, 5.38 p.m. On September 9th, Detective Baumover requested I upload the images and videos I took on my department-issued cell phone while at Walmart on August 14th. The video and images were of the adult female and two juvenile females that a citizen believed were Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. I also took screenshots of the text messages Detective Baumover and I exchanged while I was at Walmart. The photos, videos, and text messages were uploaded to Evidence.com. No further information. Uh, next is Supplemental 57 from per Purcell, uh, FPD, September 11th at uh, 5.45 p.m. It should be noted that on September 4th, while running through the evidence submission list with lab tech uh, Patricia Lopez, several items were listed that the CBI lab ultimately did not wish to take possession of at that time. Those items are crossed out on the evidence submission form, which has been added to the case file. The refused items are as follows. Oral swabs from Celeste, control swabs from Celeste, oral swabs from Bella, left palmer swabs from Bella, right palmer swabs from Bella, control swabs from Bella, right palmer swab from Shanann, left palmer swab from Shanann, control swabs from Shanann, driver's side seat cover from work truck, trace lift from center console, trace lift from back seat, driver's side. The items that were not taken by CBI were transported back to the Frederick Police Department and checked by into evidence. Nothing further. So the next several pages are just uh, the uh, listing of uh, the request for laboratory examination. So it's the items listed uh, from uh, the last part um, and it just has those items uh, crossed out that were uh, sent back to the FPD. Uh, and it just says uh, repackaged paper bag uh, next to all of or most of the other items that were still remain so and the next is supplemental 58 from Baumover uh, FPD September 12th at 5.09 p.m. On August 16th I was already on scene at the Survey 319 oil tank site as I arrived the previous evening and remained there overnight as scene security. By 10 a.m. personnel from the CBI, FBI, CSP, Weld County Coroner's Office and the Wiggins Fire Department arrived on scene. 
Also on scene were Brett, Anna Darko production supervisor, uh, Anna Darko safety personnel, and a subcontracted crew from DT Welding employed by Anna Darko. Refer to signature list complete list of names. A grid search was performed around the premises of the oil tank site, which led to the discovery of a third piece of the rake that was recovered the previous evening. I took custody of the rake piece as evidence from CBI crime scene analyst Dave Yoakum and secured it in my vehicle with the other evidence. Subsequent to a safety and operational briefing by Brett, Anadarko personnel began evacuating the oil from the east holding tank. The oil was allowed to slowly flow into a large catch pan at the base of the tank. A hose attached to a vacuum truck was placed in the catch pan which evacuated the oil through a metal strainer with holes approximately 5 8 inch in diameter. This strainer was put in place to prevent the loss of potential evidence. Brett reported the east oil tank level was approximately 9 feet from the ground which equates to 188 barrels or 7,926 gallons of crude, and the west tank oil level was approximately 1.4 feet, which equates to 28 barrels, or 1,192 gallons of crude. The oil tanks are 12 feet in diameter and 20 feet tall. It should be noted the actual amount of oil removed and tank dimensions were provided to me by Anadarko Field Foreman Luke. The Thief Hatch opening located at the top of each tank is approximately 8 inches in diameter. This dimension was recorded and photographed on scene. After several hours of draining, the east tank oil level was low enough to allow the removal of the manway cover located on the north side of the tank. DT welding employees removed most of the bolts holding the manway cover in place, but due to the highly uh, flammable hazard, CSP hazmat troopers removed the final boat bolts and cover. Once the cover was removed, two troopers donned PPE and entered the tank at approximately 3.45 p.m. and recovered the body of an adolescent female. After troopers placed the decedent into a containment pool located directly outside the tank, a Wiggins firefighter and I transferred the body to an area where Chief Deputy Coroner Joey Weiner and forensic pathologist Michael Burson could perform a preliminary examination. At the opening of the tank, I noticed what appeared to be degloved skin from the decedent's hand and asked one of the troopers to hand it to me. As he did, I noticed the fingernails were still attached. I informed Joey of this and transferred custody of the skin to her. Based on several photos I viewed previously and the information about the girl's bedtime clothing Watts disclosed in his interview, I believe the decedent was Celeste Watts. I assisted Joey in securing the decedent onto a gurney and placing her into the coroner's vehicle. After closing the manway on the east tank, DT welding employees began removing the majority of the bolts from the west tank. The oil from this tank was drained in the same manner as the east tank, excluding the use of the valve located on the south side of the tank. The oil was allowed to drain slowly into the catch pan from the manway door and then evacuated through a strainer. Once the west oil tank was drained and the manway cover was removed, troopers entered the tank at approximately 5.55 p.m. and recovered the body of an adolescent female. After troopers placed the decedent into a containment pool located directly outside the tank, a CSP trooper and I transferred the body to an area where Chief Deputy Coroner Joey Weiner and forensic pathologist Michael Burson could perform a preliminary examination. Based on several photos I viewed previously and the information about the girl's bedtime clothing Watts disclosed in his interview, I believed the decedent was Bella Watts. I assisted Joey in securing uh, Bella onto a gurney and placing her into the coroner's vehicle. Shortly thereafter, Joey and Dr. Burson left the premises en route to the morgue located at McKee Medical Center. At one point, Anadarko Regional Security Manager Tony arrived at that uh, oil tank site. I spoke with him briefly and provided a copy of the search warrant. Later I provided him a copy of the inventory list. The scene was released and I cleared at approximately 6.50 p.m. Nothing further. Detective Dave Baumover. So the next uh, page is part of Supplemental 58 from Baumover and it is uh, says the search warrant. 
Now it says the people of the state of Colorado to any officer authorized by law to execute a search warrant in the county wherein the property is located. Detective David Baumover of the Frederick Police Department having this date filed an affidavit for a search warrant in conformity with the provisions of Colorado Rules of Criminal Procedure 41 B and C for the following described property to wit. Uh, believed to be situated at the place known as Oil Tank Field, identified as Survey 319, GPS coordinates 40.2 and negative 104.3, due north of I-76 and three miles north of the town of Roggen. Uh, so then it has a uh, picture of Survey 319 and then also an overhead um, from Google Maps with it pinpointed based on the GPS coordinates. Then below that it says the following. There is probable cause to believe that now located on the property to be searched in is certain evidence to wit. I'm not sure what to wit means. The bodies of Shanann Catherine Watts, Bella Marie Watts, and Celeste Catherine Watts. Clothing of decedents. Footprints. Tools. Blood blood stains, saliva, tissue, and any other material that may contain DNA. Items with blood or DNA evidence, photographs, video recordings, and measurements. Any trace evidence, including but not limited to hairs, fibers, blood, and blood stains, tissue, fingerprints, including the taking of on-scene rolled prints of the deceased for identification purposes, and any items which may contain DNA, any items pertaining to transfer of evidence from a vehicle to the oil tanks or clandestine grave. Upon one or more grounds as set forth in Rule 41B, Colorado Rules of Criminal Procedure, namely, 1. Is designed or intended for use which is or has been used as a means of committing a criminal offense or the possession of which is illegal. 2. Is designed or intended for use or which is or has been used as a means of committing a criminal offense or the possession of which is illegal. 3. Would be material evidence in a subsequent criminal prosecution. The names of persons whose affidavits have been taken is in support hereof are Detective Dave Baumover and I am satisfied that there is probable cause to believe that the property so described is located on the person, premises, or in the vehicle above and uh, described. You are therefore commanded to search forthwith the person, place, or vehicle above described for the property described at any time, day, or night. This warrant shall be executed within 14 days of the date the warrant is issued. The return shall be made promptly and shall be accompanied by a written inventory of all property taken. You shall deliver to the person from whom the property is taken or from whose premises or vehicle the property is taken a copy of this warrant together with a receipt for the property taken or in lieu of thereof to leave the copy and receipt at the place from which the property is taken and to deliver the, to the issuing judge a written inventory of the property with the return of this warrant dated this 15th day of august 2018 at weld county colorado julie uh, c hoskins was the uh, judge so the next page is uh, another copy of the affidavit for search warrant uh, this one though includes uh, at the bottom uh, the following it says based upon the following facts uh, on August 13th, 2018, at approximately 1.40 p.m., Officer Coonrod was dispatched to 2825 Saratoga Trail on a check well-being call. The reporting party, Nicole, called about her friend, Shanann Watts. Nicole stated she dropped Shanann off at her residence around 1.48 a.m. on August 13th after returning from a business trip that took place in Arizona. Nicole stated Shanann was 15 weeks pregnant and was not feeling well during the trip. Later that morning, Nicole became concerned because Shanann was not answering her phone calls or text messages and also missed her doctor's appointment that was scheduled for 10 a.m. Nicole went to Shanann's residence and discovered her car in the garage with car seats positioned inside of it. 
Note, Shanann and her husband, Christopher Watts, have two daughters who are three and four years old. Nicole attempted to enter the front door, but a latch prevented it from opening more than three inches. Nicole called Christopher Watts and requested he come home to check on Shanann as she believed Shanann may be suffering or passed out due to some medical conditions. Upon arrival, Officer Coonrod checked all windows and doors, including the rear slider door, and discovered all of them were locked with no way into the house. Officer Coonrod contacted Chris and asked for the code for the outside garage door keypad, who stated it didn't work, but he was only five minutes away. When Christopher arrived, Officer Coonrod entered the home with Chris's consent in an attempt to locate Shanann and their two children, but discovered they were not in the home. When questioned by Officer Coonrod, Chris and Sh said Shanann arrived home from her trip around 2 a.m. Chris said he woke up around 5 a.m. and began talking to Shanann about marital separation and informed her he wanted to initiate the separation. Chris stated it was a civil conversation and they were not arguing but were emotional. Chris stated around 5.27 a.m. he backed his truck up to the garage door to load up tools and left uh, for work and that Shanann was in bed when he left. Note, a neighbor's video surveillance system recorded this event. Chris said Shanann told him she was going to a friend's house later that day with their two children, but didn't know the friend's name. Chris, who works for Anna Darko, stated he went to a job site near Hudson to check on it. At Officer Coonrod's request, I responded to the scene and arrived at approximately 2.35 p.m. Upon arrival, I was briefed by Officer Coonrod and also learned Shanann's personal effects, including her cell phone, purse, and wallet, and medication were located in the house. Upon entering the residence, I observed Shanann's purse on a kitchen island and a suitcase located at the bottom of the stairs leading to upstairs bedrooms. A pair of women's shoes were located near the front door. Upstairs, I observed the bed in the master bedroom had been stripped of its bedding, which was lying on the floor. Officer Coonrod and I both checked the bedding for signs of foul play, but found nothing. In a loft area located between the bedrooms was Shanann's cell phone that I later learned was found between two cushions of a sofa located in the loft area. On scene, I asked Chris to walk me through the period of time when he last saw Shanann. Chris said Shanann arrived home from the airport at approximately 1.48 a.m., at approximately 4 a.m., he informed Shanann he wanted to go through with a separation, and they were both upset and crying. Chris said Shanann told him she was going to a friend's house that day. Chris said at approximately 5.27 a.m., Chris backed his work truck into the driveway to load up tools and shortly thereafter drove off to a work site near Hudson. Neighbor Nate's home video surveillance shows Nicole's vehicle leaving at 1.48 a.m. At 5.27 a.m., Chris's truck is observed backing into the driveway and leaving a short time later. Chris provided consent to check Shanann's phone and ultimately surrendered it to allow me to examine it for information leading to Shanann's and daughter's whereabouts. I transported the phone to Frederick Police Department where it has remained since I collected it. A neighborhood canvas was conducted for several hours later that evening by patrol and a check well being bolo was initiated through dispatch. On August 14th at approximately 7 a.m., I learned neither Shanann nor the girls had returned to the residence. I requested an immediate press release be issued and initiated assistance from CBI and ultimately the FBI. A two-day investigation revealed Chris was actively involved in an affair with a co-worker which he denied in previous interviews and a subsequent polygraph. The polygraph also indicated Chris was very deceptive when answering questions regarding knowledge of Shanann's and the girl's whereabouts and if he had anything to do with their disappearance. In a subsequent interview, Chris was confronted about his deceptive polygraph results and asked to speak with his father, who was present at the police department. Chris said he would tell the truth after speaking with his dad. After being allowed to speak with his father, Chris stated after he told Shanann he wanted a separation, he walked downstairs for a moment and then returned to his bedroom to speak with Shanann again. While in the bedroom via baby monitor located on Shanann's nightstand, he observed Bella sprawled out on her bed and blew and Shanann actively strangling Celeste. 
Chris said he went into a rage and ultimately strangled Shanann to death. Chris said he loaded all three bodies onto the back seat of his work truck and took them to an oil work site identified as Survey 319 with uh, following GPS coordinates. Chris said he buried Shanann near two oil tanks and dumped the girls inside the oil tanks. Chris was presented an aerial photograph of the tank battery area and identified three separate locations in which he placed the bodies. Prior to Chris's confession, investigators arrived at Serbi 319 with consent to initiate a drone search of the area. At approximately 4.15 p.m., investigators spotted a bed sheet in the field near the tank battery. The sheet matched the pattern of several pillowcases and a top sheet recovered from a kitchen trash can from the Watts residence earlier that day. That search was conducted with prior consent provided by Chris. The drone search also revealed fresh movement of dirt consistent with a clandestine grave near the oil tanks. Your affiant respectfully requests the issuance of a search warrant to complete a search of the identified premises. Uh, Detective Baumover, uh, this affid David, consisting of four pages, was subscribed and sworn to before me this 15th day of August, and that is Judge Julie Hoskins. Uh, the next page is just, uh, it says return and inventory. The undersigned officer being sworn says on the 15th day of August, I duly executed the within search warrant by taking into my possession from the person at the place or in the vehicle named in said warrant certain property and the following is a true, complete, and correct inventory of the property as taken, referred to the attached inventory list. I further certify that said inventory was made by me in the presence of Tony, and that a copy of said warrant and a receipt for the property taken was given to me, uh, given by me to Tony, the person from whom or from whose premises the vehicle or vehicle the property was taken or was left by me at. Uh, and then signed Detective Baumover, sworn and subscribed to before me this 21st day of August, 2018. Then it lists a notary, uh, public, or deputy clerk um, as just notarizing the document. Uh, the inventory shall be made in the presence of the ap applicant for the warrant and the person from whose possession or premises or vehicle the property was taken if they are present or in the presence of at least one credible person other than the applicant for the warrant or the person from whose possession or premises or vehicle the property was taken. It says, on the 17th day of August, 2018, I received the items listed in the foregoing in, uh, inventory. And it is a name, uh, Amanda, who is an, uh, a technician. I'm not sure what that name is, an evidence technician. So the next is just the uh, inventory log, black plastic bag, gray and white bed sheet, rake head, rake handle, suspected hair from east oil tank, uh, rake attachment sleeve, remains of Shanann Watts, remains of Celeste Watts, and remains of Bella Watts. All three of those say released to coroner. Next page is uh, Supplemental 59 from uh, Purcell, Officer Purcell, August, sorry, this is on September 13th at 7.35 a.m. This supplemental report was generated solely for the purpose of creating property numbers and tag numbers for CDs created for Well DA investigator Kathy Holscher to aid in discovery for the defense. This round of CDs contains a total of 24 discs. These CDs contain all media files such as body-worn camera and photos. These CDs will be created and given to Kathy Holscher as the media files come in. Nothing further. Uh, next page is Supplemental 60, also from Purcell. This is September 13th at 11.56 a.m. On September 13th at approximately 11 a.m., Evidence Supervisor Purcell was in the process of booking and organizing evidence in the evidence room located uh, at Frederick, Colorado, Colorado. Upon moving one bag of evidence for this case, it was noticed the bag had begun to mold. Evidence Supervisor Purcell immediately placed the bag into the evidence freezer and notified uh, Commander Egan of the finding. The evidence is listed as, in quotes, dirt from coroner's sheet. 
This was dirt collected from the bottom of the drying cabinet at the time the sheet was hung to dry. Nothing further. Okay, the next uh, page, it's listed as Supplemental 61 uh, from Officer Perez. This is September 14th at uh, 9.29 p.m. Location of this one is uh, the 6300 block of Steeple Rock Drive. On August 14th, that's the, the, the Tuesday, at approximately uh, 7, 10 p.m., I assisted officer lines with canvassing the neighborhood. I spoke with a woman who resided on 6328 Steeple Rock Drive. I asked her if she had reviewed the flyer an officer had left on her door and if she happened to know the Watts' family. She stated she was aware of the situation but did not know the family. The woman stated she had not seen anything suspicious around the neighborhood other than an older gray Ford truck stop to dump out his beer can and then later come back to retrieve it. This was the only house I contacted before getting called away to handle other calls for service. Nothing further. That's really odd because anyone that... Anyone that's going to toss out a beer can is generally not going to go back to retrieve it interesting the next page is supplemental 62 also from Perez uh, September 14th at 9 51 p.m. and this location is uh, at the, the FPD on September 14th, after several attempts to speak with someone at the McDonald's that knew about the surveillance system, I finally got a call back from the supervisor, Brian. Brian advised the McDonald's did not use a security system company. Brian advised that they only used a DVR that only held enough memory for approximately two weeks before automatically deleting to free up memory space. Brian advised in the flash drive I had provided him, he was able to put all of day August 10th and only about half the day of August 11th worth of video. I was unable to retrieve video surveillance of August 12th, 13th, and 14th. Nothing further. Next is Supplemental 63 from Officer Manley on September 19th at 12.26 p.m., also at the FPD. On August 17th, I received an email from Zach who stated that he worked for the Flatirons HD Ultrasound Office located in Erie, Colorado. Zach stated that he heard about what happened on the news and wanted to inform the police that Shanann Watts and Christopher Watts had been in their office on August 8th. He advised me there that there was video recordings in the office and he sent me a link of those videos. I did not review the videos in full and Zach reached out to the FPD on his own accord. Evidence technician Amanda Purcell, FPD, downloaded the videos and placed them on a CD and into evidence. End of report. Next page is another uh, supplemental 64 from uh, Officer Purcell, September 20th, 1154 AM, also at the FPD. On September 5th, at approximately 4 p.m., Evidence uh, Supervisor Purcell took custody of two flash drives dropped off at the PD by a man stating the flash drives were for either Officer uh, Brent Manley or Kate Lines from Conoco. The man did not state what they were for. Uh, Purcell spoke with Officer Lines about the flash drives. Officer Lines stated she was unaware what the flash drives were for. Upon speaking with Officer Manley, it was learned that the flash drives were uh, for the Watts case. I then handed the flash drives over to Detective Baumover so that he may view them if he wished. Neither Officer Manley or uh, Officer Lines viewed the content of the flash drives. Next is Supplemental uh, 65 from Officer Manley, September 20th at 12.26 p.m., also at the FPD. On August 15, 2018, I went to the Frederick Travel Center uh, located uh, at 3768 State Highway 52 to see if I could get the recordings from their security cameras. Officer Lines had been to the facility earlier in the week providing dates and times that we were wanting to record. 
I spoke with Robin, who told me that she would be getting the recordings placed on USB drives and will get the USB drives to me when completed. I was advised by Robin on August 27th that the recordings were completed. The USB drives were received at the police department by Amanda Purcell and added into evidence. I took screenshots of the text messages between Robin and I concerning the recordings and the USB drives. Those have been added to this report. My body-worn camera was not on while I was in the store talking to Robin about when the recordings would be finished. So it's interesting that they went uh, and asked for these, and then as it says in the previous report, um, that neither Manly or Officer Lines viewed the content of those flash drives. So next we just have some back and forth texts uh, between Robin from the Conoco station and the police. So this is uh, starting with Robin. Hi Brent, this is Robin from Frederick uh, Travel Center, the Conoco station. Was wondering if you guys still need the video surveillance that you came in and talked to me about yesterday. Considering the devastating outcome of the case, please let me know as soon as possible. Hi Robin, yes, we are still wanting all the video we can to try and have a complete and accurate timeline. Thank you. Do you think that would be finished today by chance? I will see what I can do. We'll let you know around noon how far I'm able to get by then. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. This is on now Monday, August 20th at 4.47 p.m. Got all the video for North Register onto the thumb drive. Now I'm working on the South Register. Sorry it's taking so long, but it's because it's all in color, and that takes forever. Okay, thanks. Will it be ready by Wednesday, do you think? We'll try. Gonna run out of space on the thumb drive, but pretty sure we have extra ones here. I'm the only one that is working on it. And on the 27th at 1.49 p.m., also from Robin, got the footage done finally. Thumb drives are ready to pick up. Okay, next we have Supplemental 66. This is from Officer Purcell on September 20th at 12.36 p.m. at the FPD. On August 17th, Evidence Supervisor Purcell requested the 911 call and radio traffic from the initial check well-being call for this case from Weld County Communication and Dispatch. On September 5th, the requested CD was received through the U.S. Postal Service and put into evidence by Evidence Supervisor Purcell. Nothing further. Um, the next page is also part of that Supplemental 66 by Purcell, and this uh, just is a form. It says uh, Greeley Weld Criminal Justice Records, lists the case number, and this says Application for Release of Criminal Justice Records, Dispatch Recording. So this is the form for the uh, 911 call uh, that was made. On the next page, Supplemental 67, also from Purcell. This is September 20th at 1244 p.m. at the FPD. It says, on September 19th, Evidence Supervisor Purcell received an email from Detective Baumover forwarded to him from Officer Brent Manley, containing links to security footage and medical files from an ultrasound imaging office located in Erie. Evidence Supervisor Purcell attempted to access these links, but was denied. Supervisor Purcell notified Detective Baumover of this, and he then provided contact information for Zach with Flatirons HD Ultrasound LLC. Evidence Supervisor Purcell then contacted Zach to request access to the files through Google Drive, where the files were shared. The files were downloaded and saved to the case file by Purcell. Nothing further. So uh, next page is also Supplemental 67 by Purcell. This is an email from Detective Baumover. Uh, this is just regarding what we just read. It says, Brent, uh, Amanda is downloading the videos from the links Zach provided, but you'll need to complete a supplemental for this since Zach sent the files to you directly. Uh, next email is from Brent to Detective Baumover saying ultrasound clinic for Shanann. And then next is from uh, Zach, originally to Brent, and it reads as follows. Actually, this is on Friday, August 17th at 11.23 a.m. To whom it may concern, we are a non-diagnostic 
a prenatal ultrasound center in Erie, Colorado, and were made aware of what has happened to this family recently. This is truly a horrible situation, and we send our best wishes to their family. The Watts family visited our location on August 8th from 6.40 a.m., or sorry, 6.40 p.m. to 7.16 p.m. for an elective 3D, 4D prenatal ultrasound. Here are all the files collected from their visit. Attached in the document are links to video clips from our security camera, the digital ultrasound files, and the family picture we acquired. We also have sign-in forms at the office if, if needed. Also, we prefer not to have any press involvement as to not scare our clients, so we ask that you please do not publicize our information or reference us to the press. Thank you in advance for your understanding. Most sincerely, FHDU. It's pretty sad to think about the fact that there on August 8th, just five days before, you know, Chris was going to an ultrasound um, facility to get information on a new life that was going to be coming into this world. And five days later, he took all those lives. You know, he took that life and the lives of his, the rest of his family. It's just, it's unbelievable. You know, how could this guy be going to this, you know, supporting his wife in, in the, what will be the birth of a new child and just five days later, he's snuffing out the life of his entire family. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, next pa page are just uh, links for that, and some of it's redacted. And then we get into the next page, which is Supplemental 68 from Officer Brent Manley, September 20th at 6.01 p.m. at the FPD. And it reads... On August 15th, 2018, at about 10.15 um, p.m., I, Officer Manley, assisted Officer Walsh and Sergeant Bakes, both with Frederick Police Department, with executing a search warrant on the home of Chris Watts. I left the residence and helped Brad from Brad's towing and recovery secure the vehicle Chris Watts was driving. I had sealed the vehicle with evidence tape prior to Brad arriving to tow the vehicle to his secured lot. I ensured the evidence tape on the vehicle was still in place when the truck left the scene. I returned to the house and met with Officer Walsh. I assisted with collection of some bedding from the master bedroom. I returned to the house and met with Officer Walsh. I assisted with collection of some bedding from the master bedroom. I carried the plastic bags from the upstairs to the bottom floor. I assisted with looking at the baby monitor from the master bedroom and taking videos of what the camera would have seen if the babies were in the room. I assisted Officer Walsh with collection of the baby monitor from the master bedroom. I was wearing a body camera at the time. I was in the residence and that recording has been added to this report. I left prior to all the items being removed from the house and did not see where the items went. End of report. Okay, the next page is Supplemental 69 from Officer uh, Ian Albert on September 20th at 10 p.m. also at the FPD. And it reads, on September 20th, 2018, at approximately 5.30 p.m., I was advised by Weld County Dispatch to contact Daniel via phone regarding information on the Chris Watts investigation. I called Daniel, at redacted number, who said he resides in New York City and had a theory about the case. Daniel believed there was a connection between Chris Watts and the Zodiac Killer from the early 1970s. Daniel then continued to make several incoherent statements regarding Chris's late wife possibly being a lover of a male named James, who also may have links to the Zodiac Killer. Additionally, Chris may not be the father of these children, and that James may be their biological father. Daniel did not provide any factual information about the matter. He said this was only a theory, and I could take it for what it was worth. Nothing further at this time. Next is Supplemental 70 from Balmover. Uh, this is uh, September 21st at 1.01 p.m. And this is at the FPD. And it reads, The following information was documented at the time it was gathered. The date of this report is not indicative of when the investigation occurred. 
On September 10th, I transported the following items to the Northern Colorado Regional Forensic Laboratory for forensic examinations. Evidence item number 98 is Chris Watts' work cell phone. It is a black iPhone 5S model ME341LL-A with evidence tag 14763. This phone was used by the defendant when the crimes allegedly occurred and was seized incident to arrest. Evidence number 99 is Chris Watts' personal cell phone. It is a black iPhone model MN522LL-A with evidence tag 14764. This phone was used by the defendant when the crimes allegedly occurred and was seized incident to arrest. Evidence number 100 is Shanann's cell phone. It is a rose gold iPhone model MN562LL-A with evidence tag 14765. This phone was used by the victim when the crimes allegedly occurred and was recovered on August 13th. Evidence number, uh, item number 104 is the mistress's cell phone. It is a black iPhone 6 with evidence tag 14777. This phone was in the mistress's possession during the time of an alleged affair with defendant and when the crimes allegedly occurred. Forensic examination reports are pending. Nothing further. So that's where we're going to end this part, finishing here on page uh, 1,112. Um, again, I know we covered a lot of different topics in this part. A couple things I want to touch on is, one, uh, it's pretty interesting that Chris did not take advantage um, when he was shown the photos or videos of uh, you know the three people in Walmart. I don't know that I realized that uh, before, but uh, you know, he ended up saying no, it's not them. It certainly, he could have, um, you know, said yeah, that's them, and and you know, cause the uh, police to have to spend resources, uh, you know, probably going after those folks and and looking, uh, you know, in those areas and having to question people more in that neighborhood. Uh, so. It's interesting that he didn't take advantage of that. I don't think he was uh, clever enough, quite frankly, to deviate from whatever plan he had. Uh, I don't think he's he was able to really, uh, you know, come up with things on his own. He was relying on other people most of the time for what to do next. So uh, it was a really... Um, great thing that he wasn't smart enough to take advantage of that that could have thrown a lot off in this case another thing is just to remember all the formalities that the police have to go through with writing supplementals uh, putting together search warrants uh, you know presenting them to a judge for signatures you know they have to operate very much by the book very much by procedures and so you know, when you think about what they accomplished and how they accomplished it with keeping Chris, um, you know, there, keeping him in plain sight so that he wasn't going to go disappear or stop talking or lawyer up is pretty amazing uh, considering, you know, all of these um, technicalities and uh or I should say technical aspects that they had to, you know, have to follow regularly. So uh, we forget that they have to do all these things like search warrants before they can proceed with searching or, you know, have him fill out a form and get his consent before they can search his house. Um, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a lot. So kudos to them for, you know, accomplishing what they did um, while also staying by the book. They did not seem to deviate from procedure, and, uh, and that's a great thing in the end. Um, and lastly, I simply cannot get over the scene of the recovery of Bella and Celeste. It's obviously incredibly troubling, um, and uh, I just feel f for them and the family and Again, the folks that were at that scene and had to handle all of that. God bless you all. In loving memory of Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico, God, please, we pray for the Rusek family. We pray for all these folks involved. 
at the scene. Please give them peace. Allow them to sleep. Prevent them from having nightmares. And um, give them the support that they need. This is The Diplomat. Have a great day.